I'd like to talk to you today about a particular magazine that was published by US News and World Report a few years back. They published a magazine which largely was comprised of a cover article entitled 50 Ways to Fix Your Life. We're only going to cover the first two this afternoon. No, I <laughs> keep on returning to it as we come back. But apparently it was such a great success for uh, US News that they even created a, you might say, a web presence of uh, these 50 ways. Uh, it looks from my understanding of it, they have modified it some way. But this 50 ideas uh, to fix your life uh, sort of became a selling point. And you'll find there are other uh, people who have written about 50 ways to fix your life. So they devoted the, the majority of the magazine to these 50 ways. And they started by advocating that the first way to, uh, to fix one's life is to simplify, which was rather interesting because I remember somebody else telling us that in the early 1980s. Is I'm, am I correct? First thing, to simplify your lifestyle and so forth. And of course, the first, uh, the probably the 20% of the uh, uh, magazine was devoted to the simplification factor. But the, the second area they got into really surprised me. Very, very much so. Because it's a subject which we touch on from time to time. In fact, if you take this word and put it into the search box for the church website, you'll find there are pages of responses where this word is used in a sermon. I know Dr. Meredith gave a, or actually wrote, a personal for the Living Church News in 2012 on this particular subject. And of course, the second point they tried to make was learn to meditate. Oh, rather interesting to have a magazine like US News and World Report talking about the aspect of meditating. And they went on to describe meditation in some detail. And they, gave, they devoted two whole pages of the, uh, the section of the magazine to the ideas of meditation. But of course, what they were talking about in those two pages was not what we normally refer to when we talk about the need to meditate. And so they, they, uh, the writer of this particular section talked about the countless forms of the ancient mind-body practice, also known as mindfulness, which is thousands of years old. They went on to describe transcendental meditation, body awareness meditation, and various other forms of meditation. And of course, this was graphically portrayed. They had a suitably portrayed uh, uh, this idea of meditation with an elegant lady sitting cross-legged on a stool in a meditative pose. She described how eventually, after much time, she was able to empty her mind of everything. She could just hear herself breathing which tells me she didn't empty her mind of everything. Because if it was absolutely empty, she wouldn't have heard herself breathing. She was advocating this from the point of view of a person's health, well-being, and dealing with stress management. And of course, ideal things to think about, stress management. And some of the troubles in which people find themselves in this day and age the Bible very clearly speaks about meditation or the idea of meditating in a very different way than transcendental or body awareness meditation. If one considers the aspect of meditating in the Bible, we find it's frequently associated with the Psalms and the wisdom literature. Psalms and the book of Proverbs. Uh, one exception to that is the book of Isaiah. How frequently the idea of meditating appears in the book of Isaiah as well. But the majority are in the Psalms and the book of Proverbs. Mr. Lyons talked about worshipping today. 
rather interesting how these subjects actually tie together in a remarkable way. A very important way as well because so often today the idea of worship is entertain me. It's all about me. Make me feel good. And yet worship, as Mr. Lyons was conveying to you, is not about that. It ultimately speaking is about serving God and seeking his ends. And meditation is in exactly the same boat, part of the same uh, consideration. And so one of the lessons that we learn from the uh, usage of the, in the Psalms and the Proverbs is that the idea of meditating is a key to developing a relationship with God. That's his intention. He wants a relationship with us. And he says, here is a tool to help build that relationship. Another lesson, you might say, is the reverse of a coin, so to speak. In that it characterizes the way in which people misuse meditation. So the idea of meditation is used positively and you might say the examples are given of negative use of meditation in God's word, whereby people use that means to destroy relationships, to destroy the relationship they're supposed to have with their creator and with their fellow man. But the majority of the lessons we're given in terms of meditation throughout these two books and throughout God's word is in terms of building a positive, substantial relationship with our creator and fellow man. The type of relationship that Dr. Winnell was referring to in the uh, uh, comment this week. So we find a very major difference between the meditation that the world speaks of and the meditation that God speaks of. Now, surprise, surprise, when uh, we look at the Bible and you take out a concordance and look up the word meditate, you don't get all the references to meditation in the Bible because oftentimes the translators use different terms for the Hebrew or the Greek expressions, as the case may be. And so the Hebrew word that's been translated meditate is frequently translated as other way, by other means as well. And this creates a very distinct differentiation between the meditation of this world and the meditation that God requires of us. For instance, we just heard about this lady being so empty-minded she could hear herself breathing. Well, the meditation that God requires of us can be vocalized. It can be expressed. It doesn't have to be silent. It can be silent, but frequently when meditation is referred to in God's word, it's also spoken of in terms of articulating what is being thought about. There are a number of words that relate to this aspect of meditation that are taken from the Hebrew root to meditate. And they're developed in terms of a translation to try and convey an idea a little more fully. So let's look at one. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28. The heart of a righteous. We talked about righteousness already today. The heart of a righteous studies how to answer. Now, that's the way in which it appears in the New King James Version. In the Hebrew, it means meditates. The same word that would be translated meditate in other places we will look at. So it's a matter of studying, taking something and turning it over. What's behind it? What's inside it? What am I to learn from this? And so the aspect of studying, of taking something, of examining and considering it and putting it in its right place. And so the proverb continues, it said, the heart of a righteous studies how to answer but the mouth of a wicked pours forth evil. There's nothing value there whatsoever. It's absolute rubbish. 
And so we find it is the heart of the righteous that studies how to answer. People's hearts can generate righteousness and sadly they can generate evil. Brings an interesting subject, doesn't it? Because what is it that studies to understand righteousness? It's the heart that studies to understand how to answer. There is something associated with the heart. Now, of course, for the Hebrews, the heart was the seat of understanding in a profound way. They hadn't caught up with the Greeks who told them it's a mind. Well, of course, today we find out the heart has something to do with understanding as well. So you don't follow after the Greeks. The Hebrews had an understanding of the human physiology that may have been divinely inspired as opposed to the uh, atomistic approach of the Greeks. So uh, the heart, throughout God's word, is seen as the seat of emotions. They didn't necessarily understand the operation of the brain and the mind and so forth in a way we might today with creating synapses and, and uh, connections and rewiring the brain, etc., etc., that we do in the 21st century. But the heart was the seat of the human being. That's where it was all at. We might say that the heart controlled the approach of a human being to another being or to their creator. And so the heart is fundamental in terms of scripture. And we find that in terms of the New Testament as well, where we'll uh, turn in a few moments. So the heart of a righteous meditates how to answer. How does your heart meditate? And of course, I've changed it from studies to meditate because it's the same word as meditate. How does your heart study or meditate how to answer? So a uh, good treasure which we speak of. And just in case you think it's a very quiet study, the heart of a righteous studies how to answer right? Which is an articulation, is speaking. So if this is articulated in some manner, it either has to be spoken of or it has to be addressed. Psalm 37 uses the same word that we would translate as meditate in terms of this very subject. Psalm 37 and verse 30. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom, and his tongue talks of justice. Now, once again, it could have just as easily been translated. The mouth of the righteous meditates wisdom, but, but, and his tongue talks of justice. So wisdom and justice go together throughout God's word. And so here the aspect of meditating is associated with speaking. The mouth of a righteous speaks wisdom, meditates wisdom. So having studied or meditate how to answer, a meditative answer is able to be given and provided. Psalm 35, if we we'll go back a couple of uh, psalms, it said, My tongue shall meditate of your righteousness. Well, of course, the translators didn't think that was too good, so they changed it to speak, because that's normally what a tongue does, right? It speaks. But the psalmist said it meditates. It meditates on your righteousness. So uh, we have this, he said, of your praise, of carrying on in that verse, verse 28, and of your praise all the day long. So the psalmist had an appreciation of God's righteousness. His mind was given to it, and he wished to articulate that and carry it to other people. So you might say, meditation in terms of God's word is filling your mind with something as opposed to emptying your mind. It requires that the mind be filled with the things of God. 
And Jesus Christ drew the same analogy, speaking to the leaders of his day and to the rest of humanity, including you and me. He addressed the same important aspect, even though it's not necessarily speaking of meditation. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 33. Matthew 12 verse 33, he talks about fruit. What comes out of our mouth? Is it good or is it evil? He said uh, to the uh, people listening at that time, he said, either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. We have enough fruit trees around in North Carolina for most of you to be abundantly aware of that. He went on and gave a standard whereby we could judge ourselves and judge our fruit. In verse 34, he said, brood of vipers. Wow, that's pretty strong language, isn't it? Brood of vipers. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's your heart associated with? The good things of God or the evil things of his world? He said, a good man out of a good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of evil treasure of his heart or evil treasure brings forth evil things. And he went on, he said, I say to you that every idle word men may speak, they will give account of in the day of judgment. So it's pretty important we think about what we're going to speak of, correct? In other words, we spend some time meditating on what we're going to say. It was a challenge that they were to appreciate. If you want to speak good things, it's not just a matter of your tongue wagging and making nice noises. It's got to come out of the innermost being of the individual. Well, people can provide flattery. They can make pleasant sounds and butter you up and so forth. But what's behind it? What is the seat of good and evil in the human being? Jesus Christ said, it's the heart. Just like the psalmist understood, it's the heart. And so we find in Mark chapter 7, Jesus Christ in verse 20, having talked about the aspect of purity and the way in which the, uh, the religious leaders of his day had sort of superimposed ideas of purity, which were involved in the washing of hands and washing of plates, etc., etc. Jesus Christ said in verse 20, he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? That makes him unclean. For from within, out of the heart of man or men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Oh, all come out of a heart. All of these things, evil things come from within and defile a man. So Jesus Christ was very much aware of the nature of human beings he was speaking to the very same subject that both David and Solomon had spoken to beforehand about how the heart of the righteous studies or meditates how to speak or how to answer a question. What comes out? What's in the heart? It's as simple as that. You might say that the aspect of meditation goes right to the very core of a human being. What are we about? What motivates me? What motivates you? What is the basis of our relationship with God? I think it's worthwhile to consider that. 
Perhaps one of the most invaluable lessons a person can really ask themselves is, what is the basis of my relationship with God? Now, when I first started doing a master's degree in theology, I very quickly came aware of a problem that people had because in one of the core classes for a theology degree, you had to write a credo, what was called a credo, which was a 20 to 50 page paper on what motivated you. And it was interesting because so many of these people who were taking theology classes, it was almost as though this was the end of the world. I'd never thought of it. And it was interesting hearing some of the comments that came from people taking the class, wondering how are they going to write 50 pages about what they think? Real challenge. Now, I had the privilege of being able to do the class with the likes of Dr. Tomano and certain other people of that time. And it was rather interesting to read the papers of uh, the various people. Everyone approached it from a very different angle. But the men who I knew who handled it, hey, they had a core to them at that point. They, 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 they had something that really tied them to the eternal. And so it was really interesting. I know what it was in terms of myself, what I wrote about, and I wrote about obedience to God and keeping his commandments. And not just keeping them as an end in themselves, but as so many people do, but rather keeping them as a means of coming on to understand the very character and nature of God. And I don't think I've ever lost that. It's very, very important to us, uh, very important to me. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we about? What is our center? Many people have been with us and are with us no longer. As I said, a gentleman died, I've known since 1973. A lot have disappeared over the years and the intervening years. Why? Because ultimately speaking, they didn't really have a center. They weren't anchored in God. There was nothing really in their heart that linked them to God, that would, they could meditate on, that they could relate to the Creator in a profound way. And when things changed, they just changed along with it, disappeared down the road. Rather interesting, in Kenya I had the opportunity of meeting up with a group of people that I had conducted the Passover with in 1979. 40 years ago. I'd often wondered what had happened to these people because they weren't in the, uh, you might say, in the heart of Kenya. They were north of uh, Mount Kenya in uh, the Miru district. And I'd often wondered over the years, how come we had all of these people in that far off part of the country? And so I had the opportunity of sitting down and talking with them and finding out how they actually came into the church which I'd never had the opportunity to do before, and found that all of them had been to Nairobi to hear Mr. Herbert Armstrong in 1975 when he had a three-night campaign in Nairobi. And they went, I don't know how long it took them to travel by bus or public transport, they went down to Nairobi to hear Mr. Armstrong. They obviously were uh, Plain Truth subscribers, or some of them were Plain Truth subscribers at that point in time. And uh, they go back to that. And what they learned back there in the 1970s has remained very much part of them. And they came to realize that, hold on, things aren't what they used to be. We need to start doing some looking and find out where things are. And one of them had been reading Living's literature going back over a few years. And he said, well, look at this, look at that. And here they are today. Uh, really exciting to see them and to appreciate that. But I have to say, these people clearly had something to bind them to the truth. Let's go back to the Psalms, because many times David, by way of summary, 
at the end of a psalm comes back to this aspect of meditating. So we go to the likes of Psalm 71 and picking that up in verse 23. The psalmist said, my lips shall greatly rejoice when I sing to you and my soul which you have redeemed. So clearly the psalmist appreciated his relationship with God. He appreciated the fact that he'd been redeemed from sin and that he was able to have this relationship with God. You might say very appropriate in terms of a Passover we've just kept. In verse 24, he said, my tongue shall also talk of your righteousness all the day long. My tongue shall meditate of your righteousness all the day long. And of course, translators thinking, well, meditation is an abstract aspect of the mind. It's not an articulation. Well, we've got to make it talk. But it's a meditating process. This is what I'm about, as the psalmist said. My tongue will talk of your righteousness all the day long. This motivates me. This drives me. This is what I live for. Your righteousness. He said he appreciated the being, the being that the eternal was, and what you've done for me. And what are you doing for me and for the rest of humanity? He carries on in that verse, in verse 24, he said, they are all confounded, for they are brought to shame who seek my hurt. Ah, obviously here he was realizing he was somewhat alone in his meditative approach towards the things of God. And he realized there were people against him. But he realized who had the upper hand? It was God, the one he served. And they were going to be brought to nothing. They're going to be brought to shame. He didn't have to worry about them. They're going to be confounded. They can challenge him to anything they like, but ultimately speaking, it's going to come to nothing. Because he said, I have my hope and relationship in the eternal. And so he expressed how his tongue would talk of God's righteousness. That's what it's all about. His tongue was going to be meditating on the righteousness of God. Where was the tongue connected? Not the back of the mouth, but you've already read, haven't you? It's connected to the heart. Ah, so the meditation was really established in the heart and the tongue was communicating that aspect of meditation. The tongue was driven by his heart, the very center of this man. It wasn't something flippant and light. This was the same man who was able to say the words contained in one of the most beautiful Psalms in terms of meditation. And I believe this was Mrs. Loma Armstrong's favorite verse, Psalm 19 and verse 14. Now, of course, we read this, the heavens, God's glory do declare, etc. There aren't enough verses in the hymnal to really encapsulate verse 14, where he said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O eternal, my strength and my redeemer. Yes, that's, that's a scripture that needs to be engraved in our gray matter, engraved on our heart, if you wish. It's one of those beautiful scriptures because it ties in everything about it. The words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, being acceptable in the sight of the eternal, his strength and his redeemer. And of course, it's not just his, he's our strength. He is our redeemer. He is mine, he is yours, whatever the case may be. And so with saying, let what I'm thinking, let the very core of me and what I express as a result of that, let everything about me be acceptable in your sight. And so David talked about the occasions on which he meditated on God. 
Psalm 63 and verse 6, he said, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. Hmm, he didn't lie awake counting sheep. He meditated on his Lord and Master and on the great power that he had and the wonders of it. Psalm 119 and verse 15 we, you had a sermon on this recently, but the word meditation or meditate is used a number of times in Psalm 119. I'll leave it to you to go and look out all of them. He said in verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. Concerned about the things of God. What we've been reading tells us something very important about the idea of meditating. Godly meditating presupposes that there is something in the mind to think about. The mind has got to be filled with something. The things of God. It's not to be empty. It's not to be vacant. It is to be filled with the things of God. Which means we have to put it in there, right? Right? becomes very important. We have to ingest the things of God, take in the word of God and make it part and parcel of us so that we can meditate on it. So godly meditation or godly meditating isn't about mindfulness, having an empty head, transcendental meditation, etc., etc. It's having one's head filled with the things of God as opposed to being empty of them. There must be something there. Meditation presupposes that there is something there to think about. And as I mentioned, I said the majority of the biblical references to meditation are in the book of Psalms and Proverbs, but there are a few references outside of the book. The first occasion in which we find it being referenced is in Joshua chapter 1, about doing the work of God. And so in Joshua chapter 1 and verse 1, we find that after the death of Moses, the servant of the eternal, it came to pass that the eternal spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses is dead. We're moving along. Now, therefore, rise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land that I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. And he talks about how every place they've set their foot is going to be given to them. And he gives the dimensions of it. In verse 5, he said, No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to you of their fathers to give them. Only be strong and courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you. In other words, that's got to be internalized. Do not turn from the right hand to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. And so Joshua had his work cut out for him, following on in the footsteps of Moses. One of the things that God focused upon, the eternal focus his mind upon at that point was the need to remember. Remember, observe, do, live by all the law that Moses had commanded him. You're not to go to the right hand or to the left hand. You're to live, instruct, and lead these people in the way that I've set out. And so the eternal carried it on in verse 8. He said, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Well, you see five Torah scrolls are a little large to put in your mouth. Because the mouth was not necessarily the important thing that the eternal was concerned about. Was it in his heart? And would his mouth speak of these things and instruct people of these things? 
he said, uh, how was his mouth to be controlled? Very simply, if we carry on in verse 8, but you shall meditate in it day and night, you shall that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. In other words, if one is going to meditate in a godly manner, there's got to be something in the heart to meditate upon. The word of God has got to have a very firm place in our heart. Got to be anchored there. We have to know it just as Joshua had to know it. We have to instruct one another in exactly the same way that Joshua had to instruct. Instruct to live by that word, to meditate on it day and night, constantly reviewing and considering it. Now David picks up on this in his first psalm. We read of it, don't we? We sing it, blessed and happy is a man. And why is a man blessed and happy? Well, of course, he doesn't go into iniquity. He doesn't follow the wicked in any way whatsoever. Verse 2, what does he do? His delight is in the law of the eternal and in his law, he meditates day and night. Every waking moment, what is the thought about? It's about the word of God, the law of God. You might say the law of God becomes very central to the life of a true follower of God. Who is this man who's going to be blessed? This man that the father is going to bless? Well, he talks about how he's going to be fruitful. And he goes back to what Jesus Christ was saying about people in his day, about being fruitful. What fruits do we produce? Are the fruits of our lives the fruits that come because the law of God is so much within us that it becomes part of our meditative process of life, day and night? It's very important if you want to appreciate just how important it is, David provides us with an interesting contrast because in the second Psalm, he provides an idea of wrong meditation. Psalm two and verse one. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? What are the fruits? They're not godly, are they? The nations are raging. Are they plotting a vain thing? It's not of God in any shape whatsoever. People go plotting against others. A lot of thought goes into it. Do you realize that the word plot, translated plot, it is the same word that is translated meditate in Psalm 1 verse 2. In other words, there is a positive way to do it and a wrong way to do it. The right way to do it is based on the law of God by that being totally internalized within us and we seeking to understand that in a great way. On the other hand, the negative is destructive. It wants to break down. It's not the type of meditation that the eternal desires us to have. How much energy and how much effort do people put into their machinations against others? CEOs of companies, chairmen of companies and so forth, they're seeking to get the advantage in the market. What are they doing? They burn themselves out in terms of their plotting to improve the bottom line, as the case may be. And it's not just at the uh, upper echelons. People at all levels do this. People plot or imagine, as the King James Version said, a vain thing. That's a level of effort that goes into, that should go into our meditation positively. We study God's word. What do we do when we're studying God's word? 
we probably have as many different ways of studying God's word here as there are people. Not necessarily one exact way that everyone has to study. But let's ask, what happens when you finish? Does it disappear out the window? Or is it something in your mind that you can think about for the rest of the day? That you can use to judge your own actions and decisions as you go about the day. So ask yourself, can you remember what you read or studied an hour later? Or has it gone, dissipated? It's something that needs to stay there so we can consider it and think about it and turn it over and appreciate and uh, understand the greatness of God. Many of you review your sermon notes during the week. That's good. That's good. Repetition is a great form of memorizing and getting things stuck in the mind in an appropriate manner. Very appropriate. So you can meditate on it. But how often do things remain part of us? Is our Bible study something that we get through? We've done that. Then we're on to the next thing. There is never any connection between what we've studied and how we live our lives. That's a waste of time. It needs to be changed so that you can meditate on what you've studied. We need to take that and start to work with it what we've read, come to understand it, make it part of our lives, see how it relates to us. It requires effort. It's not like mindless, transcendental meditation. It requires energy. This requires that God's word, above all else, be central to us. And we should appreciate that. David in Psalm 77 Psalm 77 and verse 10, he said, I said, this is my anguish. I've got problems. I have difficulties in life. Well, you can respond, who doesn't? Anyone here not have anguish in life? Regrets, etc., etc. Problems that they'd like to see resolved. To be human is to have difficulties. No matter what we are. To be human is to be challenged. But notice David goes on and said, this is my anguish, but I will remember the years of a right hand of your most high. I have problems, but I can put them in perspective by realizing who you are, by realizing your greatness. I will remember the way in which the eternal has intervened and helped me. Why at the Passover and leading up to the Passover do we go back to Egypt and recount the accounts of uh, the children of Israel in Egypt and the power of God in delivering them from Egypt? Because the eternal wants us to understand his power in our lives. It's no different today than it was in the 15th century before Christ. He's the same God. He doesn't change. And he wants to exercise power in our lives just as he exercised power in the lives of Israel back then. And so David remembered the years of a right hand of the Most High. He understood the power of God to intervene to take care of the problems that he faced. He's never going to forget it. Verse 11, he said, I will remember the works of the eternal. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on all your work and talk of all your deeds. So you might say we're introducing another thing that needs to be in the mind to appreciate and to be meditated upon. David said, I'm going to meditate on all your work, on everything that you are doing and appreciate that. Now we live in a really fascinating period of time in terms of what we can see and appreciate in terms of God's work. Mr. Ames has mentioned this a number of times in, in sermons in terms of the heavenly firmament, what we can see today in terms of what 
Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac, and Jacob could have seen. I came across a statement which gives an idea of the works of God, where the statement said, in 300 centuries, well, that's a bit too long in terms of human existence, but leave that aside. In the centuries, humans observed less than a million stars. But just in the last two centuries, that's the 19th and the 20th centuries, innovations and methods and research has revealed a cosmos of one billion times one billion stars. Now, my calculator isn't big enough to work it out. It just comes up with 1E18. It doesn't have enough room for all the zeros to follow because I understood it should have 18 zeros. Okay? So people before the 19th century could only see a million stars if they had ideal conditions. A million is six zeros. A billion times a billion is... 18 zeros, right? It's a massive number, if I understand the math correctly. And if I'm not, please correct me. An amazing uh, event that we, we live in this day and age. How great is the work of God? I think every one of us have been, have marveled at some of the photographs that have come from Hubble. Some of the nebulae and uh, some of the constellations that adorn the heavens. Amazed at them. We look at these wonderful pictures and uh, we see various other forms from the heavens in a way that Abraham was never able to do. He may have been able to see a little more than some other generations of humanity. Maybe the Earth's, the Earth's atmosphere wasn't as polluted then in that period of time as in recent years. But I think it's a case in point that no matter how many million stars that David and Abraham were able to see with their naked eyes, you and I at this point in time have the privilege of appreciating the works of God in a far greater manner than they could ever do. Do we meditate on it? Or do we get in our car and close the window and off we go? never give a thought to it in any way whatsoever. Technology has given us a wonderful tool to meditate on the power of God if we take advantage of it. We also live in a day and age in which people write and talk about intelligent design. People come to realize that the universe of which we were part is so governed by laws and interrelationships that it cannot be an accident. And with electron telescopes or electron microscopes and the various other forms of imaging we have today, we can understand the intricate nature of the very creation that our Heavenly Father has ordered and we are part of. So in Psalm 143 and verse 5, we've already been to uh, these Psalms before today. Psalm 143 and verse 5, David said, I remember the days of old. I remember these things of the past and uh, how important they are. I remember what you've done in terms of our lives and the lives of our fathers, forefathers. He said, I meditate on all your works. I muse. I ponder on the works of your hand. Why? because it helps us understand how great our Heavenly Father and His Son really are. Both the word translated meditate and muse uh, are related, convey the idea of meditation. David had a great appreciation of the magnitude of the God he served, enormity of the being that he served. I think it goes without saying that we're to meditate. There's got to be something to meditate upon. You know, this is what David did. He filled his minds with the things of God, with the law of God, with the creative power of God, with the intervention of the great God of Israel in the affairs of the forefathers and so forth. These were reality to him. 
And there's got to be something there to meditate in our lives just as it was in David's life or Solomon's life at the beginning. We, what comes from the word of God and from an appreciation of who and what God is. What should we meditate? I'd like to briefly discuss three separate reasons that we should use in terms of meditating. The first is that which flows naturally from the scriptures we've read. And that is to develop a relationship with our Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. These are the beings who have invited us to be part of their family. And they're offering us an insight into who they are through the law of God, through his word, through the things he's done, and the greatness of his creation. So they want to develop a family relationship in a particular manner. They're particular beings. They have a particular character. And all of those things have been made manifest to us through the word of God. They're there for us to appreciate and emulate so that we become like them. Most people don't see God's word that way. They see it as arcane, futile, chaotic, and of no value to them today. You and I have a structure upon which we can appreciate the word of God. We understand the plan of God, the purpose of God. We understand our Father's purposes. We understand very clearly that this present world is not God's world. And that's a major platform for us to meditate upon. We see tragedies like that that occurred in Mozambique. We see the chaos that occurs in our political castes. What do we think about? Is the only thing that comes out of our mouth is how great President Trump is or how bad somebody else is or how so-and-so can't get their act together, et cetera, et cetera? Or is it an understanding that this is not God's world? None of us represents the way of God. And I ache for the day when that will become reality. I know back in the latter years of the 20th century, some people in uh, our former association got to thinking that the kingdom of God has come already. Wow, I wished I could have taken them on a trip or two and just shown how far they are from the reality of the kingdom of God. Come to Kenya with me sometime and I'll show you how much the kingdom of God is required in a very profound way so that you cry out aloud for the kingdom of God to be established. So people write about trying to save the world. The problem is the difficulty of accomplishing that grows greater with each year we live. People write out the equations of how many people have to be reached to turn them to Christ. I've, re I've read some articles on this. People, you know, eventually they get lost because it's never going to happen. And what do they do? They throw up their hands and horror. Can't be right. Must be something else. They throw it all away. So the Father wants us to have a relationship with him. You and I have a unique platform and an advantage in terms of developing a relationship with the Father in Jesus Christ because we understand the very plan of God. What is happening in this world at this point in time is all transitory. It's passing. And eventually the kingdom of God will be established. And we ache for that day. We long for that day. One of the few occasions on which the word meditate is used in the New Testament is in 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's probably translated as meditate, 
because the Greek word from which the word is translated as meditate in English is the same Greek word that was used in the Greek Old Testament for the word meditate. So we've got a nice symmetry throughout the entirety of the Bible into our own language. Paul had been instructing Timothy about the way of life he was to live, the way of life that he was to instruct others to follow, the way of life that we are to live. And so the Apostle Paul said in verse 13, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, or to the teaching of God. Verse 14, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy through the laying on of the hands of the eldership. In verse 15, he said, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. Meditate on these things. Give yourself to them. Make these things central to your life so that you can progress in the way of God. Verse 16, he said, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine or to the teaching. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save yourself and those who hear you. You're going to be fruitful. You're going to be profitable to the eternal. In other words, by meditating on the teachings that Paul had given him that had come from God's word, by making those very much part and parcel of himself, by taking heed to himself, continuing in them, he was going to create a relationship with the Father and the Son that was going to help others, bring others into that relationship. And so it wasn't just for him alone. It was for those that the Father was going to call. So this aspect of developing a relationship with God is a very important one in terms of meditation. David spoke at length about it. He appreciated God's righteousness. He would meditate on it. He would meditate on the things of God, the ways of God, and continue in them. And so this aspect of developing a relationship with God is so very important in terms of meditating. There is a goal to it, becoming more like our Creator and our Father. Second point I'd like to encourage you to think of in terms of meditating Overcoming sin very clearly flows from what we've discussed today. An important goal for meditation is the avoidance or overcoming of sin. If you want to have a relationship with our Heavenly Father, it means we have to purify ourselves even as He is pure. It means we put sin away from ourselves. As David said in Psalm 19 and verse 12, two verses before the verse we read earlier on, he said, cleanse me from secret faults. Let me be pure like you're pure. He realized that he was human. He had faults, faults that he didn't see. I can remember going to church one day and we were staying in a hotel and we were waiting on the elevator to come and the housekeeping uh, closet was open next door and I looked in and on the wall there was a placard. Woman's faults are many. Men have only two. Everything they say and everything they do. <laughs> True, isn't it? <laughs> we have so many secret faults. And it doesn't matter whether we're female or male. We need to be cleansed from those secret faults. David asked in Psalm 119 and verse 9, one of the classic scriptures, he said, how can a young man cleanse his ways? Or an old man cleanse his ways? Or an old woman? You put yourself in the situation. He said, by taking heed according to your word, examining my life, in terms of the word of God. He doesn't necessarily talk about meditation in terms of this particular verse. As I said, various words can mean meditation in the Hebrew, often referred to frequently in the Psalm. He doesn't refer explicitly to meditation, 
But he asks this question, how do we clean ourselves up? By making the law of God, the word of God, central to us and considering that. There's only one way we can do it, and that's by taking heed to your word. Of course, that involves the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and that's why we're at this point wanting to clean our lives. Proverbs talks about it, Proverbs chapter 6, and verses uh, 20 through uh, 22. They will meditate, verse 22. He talks about, uh, if we just quickly uh, read the last line of verse 22. When they awake, when you awake, they will meditate with you. That's the commands of God that are to be bound around our neck. Do people understand what it means to meditate with you? We think that meditation is a one-way street. That is what we do ourselves. But the eternal is saying, no, meditate is something you do with my law and with my way of life. You look at it, you study it, you come to understand it, you appreciate it for what it is, and you see the benefits of being in harmony with it. It's something that provides a give and take as we look at it and understand it. And so verse 23, the commandment is a lamp, the law is a light, reproofs of instruction of a way of life. So we meditate upon the word of God. It can be a lamp and a light. It can provide reproof for us. And so we go on and we can read about that there in that uh, particular book of, uh, chapter of Proverbs. Third reason I'd like to leave with you is simply to be able to give an answer. Be able to give an answer. Are we able to respond to those who ask questions of us? It's important that we do. I guess one of the great challenges in Spokesman's Club is giving an impromptu speech. Why? Because somebody gives you a question that you'd never thought about. If you'd thought about it, you'd have a good answer. You'd be able to speak on the subject. But so often it's a subject that you've never given any thought to. I guess that's provoke us to think about things. We talk about this. Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 21 talked about uh, meditating. And he talks about the end times. And he tells us that we are uh, not, in verse 14, he said, therefore settle in your heart not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. That's Luke chapter 21 and verse 14. For he said, I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries, adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. He said, I'm going to bring you before kings and rulers for my namesake. These are going to be occasion for testimonies. He said, don't, don't worry yourself sick about what you're going to say because it's going to be given to you. Does that mean to say we shouldn't meditate? Some translations refer to this as premeditate. Jesus Christ said you don't have to meditate on how you're going to answer that particular situation. You don't have to be concerned about it. You don't have to learn to lose sleep over it. But we certainly need to meditate. Because we have never meditated on the word of God. How is God going to use us to answer? Is he going to make a Balaam's ass out of us? Excuse me, a donkey for you. Is he going to make a Balaam's donkey out of us? Or is he going to use something which is ingrained and established in our heart? These things happen. You get asked a question. You don't have a chance to meditate on it. But what's in your heart to answer? What's there to provide an answer? If we've meditated about the word of God, the eternal can guide us and the eternal can provide us with what is necessary for the situation. 
As we read earlier on, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 28, the heart of a righteous meditates how to answer. He's installing the word of God in his being. On the other hand, the mouth of a wicked pours forth evil. Sounds like the heavens are giving Josh Lyon some rain. <laughs> so he can rejoice at this point in time. So we have this aspect of meditation. How do we meditate? As I've said several times, there has got to be something there in our mind to focus upon. The word of God, the greatness of God. To me, it's fascinating that the, medita the aspect of meditation is so focused in the books of Psalms and Proverbs. Two books that are so deeply related to the law of God, the application of God's law, and how we live our lives in accordance with the word of God. They give positive examples, as we heard earlier on, negative examples of things to avoid, are very practical for us. So let's consider then what it is to meditate. This is a way which will change our lives in a way in which the US News and World Report never thought possible because it enables us to be in harmony with the will of God, of our Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and seek the goals and the purposes that they have, not only for my life, but for all humanity's lives, to the honor and the glory of their name forever.